let's say in cricket, let's say you're watching the cricket match and you see all those animations and graphics of ball trajectories going all along, it not only just helps the commentators, the DRS systems, the decision review systems, uh, it also gives an in-depth real-time analysis to the fans and the viewers. And in order to facilitate that, about 30 or even more cameras of high frame rate cameras are used in order to track the center of the ball from the release point of the baller to the batsman's impact point and further on to the boundary strategies. As you can see here, you can see some of the automated cameras which are quite high frame rate cameras which help you to deal with the real time data itself. Uh, I suppose a lot of people must have watched the Football World Cup recently. Now these are the footballs that we were used in the Football World Cup. These footballs are designed by IDAS and they have a little sensor in between and therefore you can also see them getting charged on the sidelines. As you can see, these sensors can track data about location, speed and direction of the football and therefore giving more insights about the whole scenario. These footballs and these sensors can, whenever kicked, these sensors fire up to about 500 frames per second data. I think that's an outstanding speed of course. Now, when we look at data analytics, it's not just about tracking. And it fascinates me how many numbers can weave beautiful data stories. It can be beautiful data stories. Uh, but above my fascination, such insights are more critical to the coaching staff and the players themselves in order to take better decisions on ground and in real time. Therefore, a very important aspect jumps into place, which is prediction. Prediction can be of anything. It can be of prediction of outcomes, strategies, player performances, etc. Now, when I was in my school days, I was a basketball player. I have played basketball on different levels also. And so, my love for the sport and my curiosity of data drove me to integrate both of these fields and contribute more to the research part. Now, when I just started uh, looking in, into this aspect, I realized that a lot of researchers and a lot of people are trying to predict outcome of every single game individually. Though they had a pretty decent accuracy, but still I wanted to push it up a bit more. Therefore, when I started looking into this, I tried different perspectives, but it did not really work out. And I came to this perspective when I thought, why can't I just predict the outcome of a team's performance? across the whole season altogether. Why right? should I get to that individual game? Why cannot we do it in a more collective sense? And in order to present that, in order to facilitate that, uh, more advanced metrics were supposed to be introduced. Advanced metrics like these, as you can see. Average points scored by a team per game. Average points allowed by the game, uh, by the team per game. And, and there are certain deeper factors that also affected the game for them. Now, if you know and if you understand, a team winning by a very close margin is not a very good indicator of the team's skill set. It can be a part of luck also. So if a team is winning by one or two, three, one or two, three points, it's not a very good indicator that the team might be a good skill set, might have a good skill set. Therefore, a new intro introduction of a new metric has to be done, which is the point differential. It is basically the numerical difference between the points scored by the team and the points allowed by the team. And other aspect which was taken into consideration was the pace of the game. No one team might be adept at playing the game quite faster than the other team. But that does not really define the efficiency of the game during the game. Therefore, we had to introduce offensive and defensive ratings as, an, as a metric because 
when we talk about such ratings, they are calculated per 100 possessions, number of points scored per 100 possessions, which can actually give you a relative scale between how the teams play on a base level. Another aspect which was quite untouched and actually piqued my interest was the different schedule of every game. And when I talk about different schedule, we can also see that some, like for example, some teams might have a greater amount of rest between two games or one team might have to travel a lot more and more frequently in order to attend their away and home matches. Now such harsh schedule can also have a performance deficit. It can cause different kind of, it can have different kind of outcomes on different teams. Therefore, strength of schedule or the SOS metric was also considered in place in order to address this issue. Now when the data was all complete and it was processed enough, we took to the machine learning part. Now you might have heard machine learning quite recently. And I believe that machine learning is a growing field of technology which helps you to predict or classify data based on the past observations itself. Now using multiple mathematical models and machine learning models, we made a single unit of prediction which can predict the percentage of the win win percentage of every team across the whole season with an outstanding accuracy of 93.3%. Now, analytics is not just about tracking data and making predictions. We also have to see what differences it actually makes on the ground level, what changes in strategies are come into place. So, let's look at one of the examples from basketball itself. As you can see here, the red line, the highlighted red line, is called the three-point line. And as you can see, this is the top view of a basketball half court. Now, if a player makes a shot from beyond the three-point line, from beyond the red line highlighted, he or she scores three points, whereas if the player makes a shot from within the red line, he or she scores two points. This is the basic scoring scheme of basketball. Now, this 3-point line, 3-point line was introduced in 1979 and it, it was introduced in order to reduce the congestion around the basket. But still, a lot of players were resistant at shooting long distance shots since it came with their, with higher risk and higher amount of uh, you know, you might even lose some good scoring opportunities and lesser chances to make them. Therefore, but, but as 21st century came into place and players and coaching staffs started looking towards analytics in order to take decisions, a major statistic came into place. A major statistic came into place which was this. If a player can make one third of his shots from beyond the line, it would be as great as making half of the shots from within the line. And this changed everything. This statistic might seem insignificant, but this changed how we see and how we play basketball today. How do we know that? There are some things to know. Now, here we can see the grey bars show the total number of shots attempted. And the red bars showing the attempts taken from beyond the three-point line, which are also called three-point attempts. Now, as you can see in the 79-88 season when the line was just introduced, you can see only 227 shots taken from 7,433 7 shots. And we can see what massive increase when it comes to the 18-19 season when almost one third of the shots were taken from beyond the three-point line. And this is a very good evidence of how analytics have changed basketball. Let's have another look at the same perspective. Now, in 1998, as you can see, the blue line shows the percentage of three-point shots taken in, in any game. Now, almost 13% was almost nothing. But as we can see, 
two decades after in 2018 season, we can see 33 percent. That is one third of the shots taken were from beyond the line, and a contrasting decline can also be seen from mid range, which is which basically gives you two points. Now, I would like to give this situation uh, another perspective. I know I'm shooting you guys with a lot of graphs here, but let's just compare two players all together from different time of their own. I'll be comparing John Stockton, who was a dominant player in the 90s, and Stephen Gilly, who is one of the most dominant players in current time in India. Now, as you can see, John Stockton's short shot, this basically shows the amount uh, and the specific zone of their short attempt. As you can see, in John Stockton, it's quite widely distributed within the 3.9. Though he has taken some 3-point shots also, but when compared to Stephen Curry, it's, it's altogether a different game. His most of the shots are from beyond the line. He is not taking mid-range shots because of this statistic itself. This statistic has changed the way how basketball is played. It, it has changed the way how strategies have evolved across the four decades from the introduction of the three-point line. And I believe this is the poetic beauty of numbers. Numbers can be used as a superset to embody a broad spectrum of sports. And I believe that with the development of machine learning, with the development of science of such beautiful data color specs, we can move towards knowledge and growth better, faster, and most importantly, more thoughtful. Thank you.